Okay, let's talk a little bit more about charge. Um, at the end of class last time, I indicated that charge is indicated by a letter Q, a capital Q or little Q, and usually um, it, it's it's all relative, but a big Q means a large charge and a little Q means a small charge, but you can use a big Q or a small charge to a big Q or a small Q to mean charge. So they mean charge. And the units of charge, the MKS units of charge, um, is the Coulomb. Whoops, charge is the Coulomb or capital C. Now there is a fundamental unit of charge, and the fundamental unit of charge is the charge of the electron or the proton. Now remember, in an atom, in an atom, so this is not the Earth anymore, it is now an atom. In an atom, you have the nucleus, and in the nucleus, the nucleus, whoops, you typically have plus charges and neutral charges. They're called protons and neutrons. And then uh, around the nucleus, you've got electrons, which is usually the E minus, minus indicating that it's a negative charge. Um, <clears throat> so in the nucleus, you've got protons and neutrons, and then going around the nucleus, let's get rid of that picture there, we've got the electrons. Um, at least in a classical atom, it's floating around that nucleus somehow. And in a, in a neutral atom, which is your sort of typical um, small atom, might be neutral, might not be, but we've got the same number of protons and neutrons. So what I have drawn here with one proton, one neutron, one electron, did I say same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons? Um, <clears throat> with one um, uh, proton, one neutron, one electron, this is a hydrogen atom. If I add a second proton, a second neutron, and then we don't have to have a second electron, but we might have a second electron, that's a helium atom. We add a third proton, third neutron, third electron. It's a neutral lithium atom, etc. So these protons and electrons are the fundamental units of charge. Fundamental means you can't get any smaller. Now that's a lie. But only a little bit of a lie, because these are the, um, the, the stable charges. You can actually break a proton up into um, quarks. I'm sure you've heard of quarks. You can break neutrons up into quarks, and quarks are charged particles. A neutron, which is neutral, actually has um, an even number of positively charged quarks and negatively charged quarks, or the same number of positively charged quarks and negatively charged quarks, while the proton has a net, net positive charge because it's got more positively charged quarks than negatively charged quarks. But for the sake of um, the kind of physics we're doing, we're only going to think of protons and electrons as the fundamental charge because quarks are not stable by themselves. They really they have to come. Um, if, if we find them separate uh, from things, it's because we've like blown something up. Um, so the stable fundamental charge is the electron or the proton. And the charge of the proton is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. This is given the fundamental charge letter of E. And so the charge of the electron is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And so that's given the fundamental charge of minus E. So don't get confused between this E minus thing that indicates the charge of, that, that indicates an electron versus the fundamental unit of charge E. In any case, you won't let yourself get confused if if you're thinking fundamental charges, we know that the fundamental unit of charge is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And if it's a negative charge, it's negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. So we should know from the context whether we put a plus or a minus sign in there. So what I want to point out is that uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs is a very small charge compared to one coulomb, compared to the MKS unit. So a coulomb is a lot of charges. How many charges in coulomb? If I have a coulomb of charge, how many more positive charges do I have than negative charges? If I have one positive charge, a proton, and one negative charge, an electron, then my total charge is what? It's zero. If I have two protons and two electrons, then my total charge is still zero. So if I have a net charge, it means I have more of one than the other.
So let's say so let's say I have a total charge of one coulomb. That tells me nothing about how many total charges I have. I could have a any number of protons and electrons, but if, if, if I have the same number of each, then my ch total charge is zero. That tells me how many excess of one I have. So if it's plus one coulomb, that means I have more positive charges than negative charges, and it means I have n charges of 1.6 to the minus 19 coulombs per charge, and so n is equal to, means I have 6.25 times 10 to the 18th charges. Not actually, that's actually incorrect. It's 6.25 times 10 to the 18th excess positive charges, more positive charges than negative charges. So let's go, let's go back ahead, or go ahead, um, and take another look at Coulomb's law. So I've written here Coulomb's law, which is the electric force between two point charges. And we said that it's proportional to the values of the point charges divided by their distance squared, and it's in the r-hat direction. That's indicated in the, in the picture. If I have two point charges, and I want to know what the force that Q1 exerts on Q2, Q1 exerts on Q2, then the force is, if they're both positive, the force is repulsive, right? So the force is away, and it's in the radial direction away from Q1, hence the radial direction um, between two positive charges. If they're two negative charges, the negatives cancel, and it's still radially away. And if they're positive and negative, then it's the minus radial direction, and it's an attractive force. But it's still the same kind of force, um, the same structure as the gravitational force. The constant K, remember the constant G in the gravitational force, GMM over R squared, G was uh, the universal gravitational constant. The constant K here um, is, is often also written as, and we'll learn more about this later, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, where epsilon 0 is called the permittivity constant. So again, K is just a proportionality constant, but some other physics can show us that we can write K, again, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We can write K in terms of this thing called the permittivity constant. Now actually, with a sub-zero on it, we usually mean that's the permittivity of free space. Epsilon 0 is the permittivity of free space. That's what the zero refers to. Permittivity of free space, in other words, a vacuum, um, whereas epsilon is the general permittivity. What epsilon is a measure of, it's a measure of how big electric forces are in certain materials. So since we're talking about these two charges are just in free space, then we use epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space. But let's say that the charges were embedded in some other material like wood or metal or glass or something. Then the electric force would be somewhat mediated by the properties of the material they're embedded in. And so we would just have K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon, um, and epsilon would be the permittivity of that particular material. We will mostly be talking about charges in free space, so we're not too worried about permittivity of materials yet. That'll come up um, later on when we talk about um, capacitance and we to putting materials between capacitor plates, but for now we're just talking about free space. So the value of K for uh, free space is 9 times 10 to the 9th, whatever units, um, that's, it's MKS units, and so that's going to be meters squared per coulomb squared newton. Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. And that also tells us uh, that epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space, is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, whatever units that should be. It should be the, up, uh, the uh, inverse, so it's going to be coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. So <clears throat> let's just look at the magnitude of this electric force for a second. Um, 
I think I said it earlier, but there's no reason you should necessarily know this, but a coulomb is actually a lot of charge. To get an excess charge of a coulomb is pretty hard to do because these charges push against each other. If you've got a lot of protons together, or a lot of electrons together, they push against each other pretty hard and they don't want to be together. That's why, <clears throat> that's why neutral is preferred. So just take it at my word that a coulomb of charge is a fairly large amount of charge. Um, and you typically won't find a coulomb of, of net, a net charge of a coulomb on something. And if you do, you don't want to touch it because you'll get a nice shock. Um, so, but let's just take two, two, two tennis balls. Maybe it's something slightly larger than a tennis ball. Because let's just, for simplicity's sake, let's say that they're one kilogram each. And let's take these two masses, two, two large tennis balls, two strong person tennis balls. Um, and let's separate them by one meter. Let's put one coulomb of charge on each of these tennis balls. Let's put a positive one coulomb of charge on each of these tennis balls. And let's ask, what is the gravitational force, the magnitude of the gravitational force between these two tennis balls? It's an attractive force, and the magnitude of that gravitational force is G M M over R squared. As, um, whatever g is and so when you plug in the numbers everything are ones except for the gravitational constant so you get 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons let's look at the electric force between these two objects what is the electric force between these two objects kqq of r squared 9 times 10 to the ninth 1 1 over 1 squared newtons so which one of these forces is bigger well, I think <clears throat> it's pretty evident from the numbers that I gave you that the electric force is significantly larger than the gravitational force. Actually, the gravitational force would be negligible, would be immeasurable compared to the electric force. These two are going to be attracted by a gravitational force of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons, but they're going to be repulsed by an electric force of 9 times 10 to the ninth newtons. What's important to take away here is, sure, we could put zero charge on these two objects and then the gravitational force would be bigger than the electric force but generally electric forces are much larger than gravitational forces so for instance when you take two fundamental charges two electrons and you put those one meter apart their electric force of um, repulsion is always going to be great much much greater than their gravitational force of attraction the electric force is a much larger force than the force of attraction and we talked about this in class the other day about the fact that the four fundamental forces have these sort of fundamental sizes and yes you can vary the sizes by varying the amount of mass and charge and distance etc but that the strong force is the largest of the four fundamental forces the weak force is the next largest the electro electric force is the next largest and the gravitational force is by far the weakest of the four fundamental forces okay to finish up our discussion of the coulomb force law the coulomb force law or the electric force between two point charges Let's go ahead and just do a couple of problems. We're not going to do a lot with this because this is identical, as I've said over and over again, to the gravitational force law, and so there's nothing new here. We we're just we just got to add two vectors, um, in order. Uh, sorry, add multiple add vectors um, when we're talking about the force due. You know, the force between multiple uh, charges. So what we do want to look at is is collections of charges and how we how we calculate the forces between collections of charges. But we just did that with gravitation. So the force between two charges, easy enough, it's a scalar thing. But the force between three charges, we had to add them, add the two forces as vectors. Um, force between a continuous charge, we had to integrate force uh, of a ring, force of a uh, uh, shell, force of a sphere. So we do the exact same thing with electricity, but it's exactly the same. There's nothing new, so there's nothing more that needs to be done, except that I'll just do a couple of quick examples. So foreshadowing, then we just want to make sure we understand Newton's shell theorem and how it, how it applies here. And then we're going to move on to the concept of the electric field. We talked about the gravitational field before, and now we're going to move, uh, once we've done a few examples, to the electric field. So in honor of the Super Bowl coming up this weekend, um, not a sport that I pay a whole lot of attention to, but who doesn't like to see the commercials on the Super Bowl? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you about the match bit, ma uh, the match stick trick, um, which I'm sure some of you have seen before. But every time I see this, I always get puzzled over it. I can never remember how to do it. The idea is, is that you have four match sticks indicated here by the things that are match stick like looking. <laughs> 
Um, and they make a goalpost, and the thing inside that goalpost is not a slug, but is meant to be a football inside the goalpost. Um, and the idea is, is can you move exactly two toothpicks, uh, so matchsticks, sorry. Can you move exactly two matchsticks to get the football outside of the goalpost, but to still have a goalpost? Um, can you move exactly two matchsticks to get outside of the goalpost? And uh, this is uh, this often puzzles me for some reason. I have trouble seeing it, but it really is. There really is. There's no trick to it. Uh, you you move two matchsticks and you make a goalpost that um, doesn't have the football in it. When if the football stays in the same place. So I'll give you a second to think about that. Actually, I'm not. I don't need to give you any time to think about that. If you want to see the answer, just let this go. Otherwise, hit pause and see if you can figure it out yourself. So the answer, when you see it, really seems quite straightforward to me anyway. Um, so you're going to take the uh, this matchstick and you're just going to move it over half a matchstick's length. And you're going to take this matchstick and you're going to go ahead and put it down here. So in the end, what you have is this matchstick which is moved over to here and this matchstick which is moved down to here and now we have got let's go ahead and erase the matchsticks that we just got rid of um, and now we've got a goal post uh, without a football in it ta da so let's go ahead and do this Coulomb's law problem um, we have three charges fixed in place on a coordinate axis and charges q1 and q2 are on the y-axis, even equally distributed around the x-axis, and charge Q3 is along the x-axis. I give the values of the charges. Q1 is plus 1 microcoulombs, Q2 is minus 1 microcoulombs, and Q3 is plus 2 microcoulombs. And I've added some distances so that Q1 and Q2 are separated by 6 meters, and Q3 is 4 meters along the axis. So what we want to know is what is the net force on Q3? due to Q1 and Q2, due to the electric force of Q1 and Q2. So the first thing we want to do is we want to draw in the force of Q1 on Q3. Q1 and Q3 are both positive charges, so we'll draw in the radius vector. This is the radius vector, and the force is therefore, whoops, is repulsive. It's supposed to be along the same line. The force between Q2 and Q3 this is the radius vector, um, <clears throat> but they are opposite charges, so it's attractive. So the force is um, opposite the radius vector uh, in that direction. I didn't draw these terribly well because there's symmetry, so I tried to erase and redraw them a little bit. But in any case, it is a symmetrical situation <clears throat> um, where the two forces um, actually create an equilateral triangle. Uh, I'll draw it a little better on the next page. Oh, no, I'll just redraw it here. So the two forces have some symmetry, and you can see that the X component of Q1 on Q3 points to the right. The X component of Q2 on Q3 points to the left. And because the magnitudes of these two forces are going to be the same, look at the Coulomb's force law, the magnitudes are going to be the same, then the X components cancel. Whereas the Y component of Q1 on Q3 points downwards, and the X and the Y component of Q2 on Q3 points downwards, and so those those two will add. So all that's left um, when we do the math, when we when we write down the two vectors and break them into components, is the Y components add and the X components cancel. So all we really need are the Y components. The magnitude of each of these forces. The magnitude of each of these forces, the electric force, in magnitude is K Q1 Q3 over R squared, or K Q2 Q3 over R squared. They each have the same magnitude, um, which we can even put in the numbers 9 times 10 to the 9th times 1 microcoulomb, that's for Q1, times 2 microcoulombs, that's for Q3, divided by their distance squared. Do the geometry, right? That four meters was the distance of the x-axis, three meters was distance along the y-axis. So the um, hypotenuse is actually five meters. I chose a three, four, five triangle. Um, so we've got five meters squared.
That's the magnitude of Q1 on Q3. The magnitude of Q2 on Q3 is going to be the same. The only thing that's different is that there's going to be a negative 1 microcoulomb right where that green arrow is, but the magnitude of the second force of Q2 on Q3 um, is still the same. There's just going to be a minus sign, which, we, which is what gives us that direction towards Q2. Let's go ahead and find the y component of the, ma of, of the magnitude of the force. Um, and so in order to find the y component, we need to find this angle right here, that angle right there, which I'm going to call theta. Now notice that I've just chosen that angle so that the y component is going to be f cosine theta. Don't be confused by sometimes y, often y components are f sine theta. I've chosen that angle so that the y component, the force that's pointing in the downward direction, um, has the, <clears throat> the relationship to the force vector of f co cosine theta. So fy is equal to f cosine theta. If you chose the other angle in that triangle, then yes, Fy would be F sine theta. So how do I know what that angle is? We need to look back at the original diagram. Look, so look above at the original diagram. Um, this here is theta that I'm indicating in the diagram. That's theta. And that angle is the same as this one here. That's theta. Theta, theta. So therefore, from the original diagram, we can see that the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent for thirds. And so from that, we can figure out what the cosine of theta is. And then we can figure out what the y component is. And remember, we're adding the two y components, which turn out to be the same because of the numbers that I chose. So the net force, which is in the, y, in the, in the downward direction, where those that, that those two vectors are parallel to each other um, is going to be uh, adding the, the, the y component of Q1 on Q3 plus the y component of Q2 on Q3. They're the same, so it's just, just going to be two times uh, one of the y components. So plugging in for the angle, I get cosine theta is 0 0.6, and therefore we can plug in the numbers, and I get F net. Uh, plugging in the 0.6 to the co uh, for the cosine theta, I get 0.86 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. And the direction is, if we choose standard directions on the previous page, then it's going to be the minus y hat direction. It's in the downward direction. Okay, so let's do one more uh, Coulomb's Law problem where we have a continuous distribution of charge. Let's say that we have a, a strange thing, but a, perhaps a strange thing, but a semicircle. Let's say that we have a semicircle, half a circle, of charge, total charge, capital Q, radius of R, and we put another charge that we want to find the force on. We put a charge Q, little q, in the center of that semicircle. And I want to find the net force, the net electrical force on little q. Just as, a, as an aside, something that we're going to come, up, uh, that we're going to come across uh, later is often when we talk about these large distributions of charges and what their force is on some small charge, we'll often just call that small charge a test charge. So let's say that we have a semicircle of to charge total Q, and we want to put a test charge. We want to test what the force is, or later on, what the field is, um, at the center. So we're going to put a test charge, little q, at the center and ask what the net force is. So how do we deal with this situation? What I need you to think about is to push pause right now and just ask yourself, how do you find the net force on little q? What are we going to do? How are we going to break it up into a situation that we can deal with? And we will deal with it in the typical ways we always deal with it when we have a continuous distribution. If I have a continuous distribution of charge, I'm going to say any one little piece of charge has a charge dq. And that will exert a force on the test charge, df, which is equal to k dq times q over r squared. In this case, r is the radius of the semicircle, because that's how far apart they are. And it is repulsive, assuming, assuming all these charges are positive. And yes, test charges are always positive, if we call it a test charge. Uh, and the semicircle, whether it's positive or negative, we're just saying it's Q. So we can just assume it's positive. If it's negative, we put a negative sign in when we plug in numbers. 
And then in order to find the net force on Q, so the net force of Q on Q, of the semicircle on the, on the test charge, we're going to sum up all the DFs. We're going to sum up all of the individual forces due to the point charges that make up the semicircle. And what you need to think about is what changes. What changes as I sum up that F? Um, K is a constant. DQ is a constant. Q is a constant, and R is a constant because we chose a semicircle, but, but the direction changes, right? I'm going to draw in a different DQ in a different direction, right? So if I have a DQ up here, it's going to have a DF down here, and that's going to have the same magnitude, but it's going to have a different direction. And so what's going to change um, is the angle, is the direction. But, but as, as we've seen before, we can just use symmetry in this situation and say that, oh, yeah, for every DQ above the horizontal bisector, there's a DQ below the horizontal bisector such that their up and down forces cancel and their uh, horizontal forces add. So I've drawn that in with the gray lines here, right? There's, for, for every force that, um, that comes from, from below the horizontal line, it's going to have a X component that points to the right and a Y component that points up, as those little gray lines are that I drew. And then there's going to be an equivalent force from uh, DQ below that has a horizontal um, that, at, that, that goes along the plus X direction and a vertical that goes opposite the vertical of the one above it. So the Y components are all going to cancel and the X components are all going to add. So all we need to do is take the X component of each DF and then the vector um, sum turns into a scalar sum. So let's go ahead and put in an angle, right? So the angle that I'm going to be interested in is in here, I'm going to call it theta, so that the x component of df, dfx, is equal to df cosine theta. So we can turn the vector equation into a scalar equation um, by saying everything's in the plus x direction if we write df cosine theta, so we don't have to worry about directions. And so I'm going to go ahead and fill in um, k q over r squared, just putting the constants in front, and we've got dq cosine theta. So we've got our typical problem here of we've got the integration variable is dq, while the thing that changes is theta. So we've got to find a relationship between dq and theta, um, which might seem a little uh, different than something we've done before, but it's not really. We're going to find a relationship between dq and theta. So here I've redrawn the semicircle, and I've drawn the dq. Remember, we want to find a relationship between dq and theta. And I've drawn a little extra geometry on this picture. Remember, we have to use something like density. Density is, always comes up here to make these relationships. The charge dq has a width ds. But what is that with ds? How does that relate to theta? Well, we take the r vector, and the r vector must trace out an arc length, right? As we move through an angle, we can call it a small angle, d theta. It's going to trace out an arc length such that ds is equal to r d theta. So that's the arc length. And remember that dq over ds the charge of the point, infinitesimal point charge divided by the length of the infinitesimal point charge is equal to the total charge of the arc divided by the total length of the arc. Now, I never gave you L, but you know what the total length of the arc is because I've given you R, right? So this is a density statement. Forget what I just said for a second. This is a density statement that I just wrote down. That The density of the point charge is the same as the density of the whole semicircle, the orange semicircle. And the density of the whole semicircle is the total charge divided by the total length, which is equal to pi r, right? It's half a circle, so it's not 2 pi r, it's pi r. So therefore, dq over r d theta is equal to q over pi r, and now we have a relationship between dq and theta, because we've got dq is equal to q over pi r times r d theta, or just 
q over pi d theta. So let's go ahead and plug that dq into the equation above. So now the, the net force on, I never drew my test charge back in this picture, the net force on my test charge is kq over r squared times the integral of dq, which is now q over pi d theta times the cosine of theta. So now again, the, whoops, this was a pi. I'm going to pull out all the constants. So we got kqq over pi r squared cosine theta d theta. And the question is, is what are the limits of integration? In other words, what does theta go from and to? So we're now integrating um, along theta. And so the question is, is what is theta? And we're going from one end of the semicircle to the other. I'm going to draw something along the semicircle here. I'm going to go from one end of the semicircle to the other. And so now you want to think about what is theta. Let's put an axis. It's like if we call this, if we call the horizontal theta zero, then we can maybe start from theta is minus pi over two and go all the way around to theta equals plus pi over 2. Whoops. I just did those angles in radians. If you don't like radians, you can say we're going from minus 180 degrees to plus 180 degrees. Somehow you need to put the thing on an axis and just say what angle are we going through. We're going through a 180 degree angle in order to do this integral. So now it's just a case of taking the integral of cosine theta d theta and plugging in the limits. So I just walked away from this for a second to help somebody declare from major, and I forget where I left off and don't know how to go back. So um, we were taking the integral. We figured out the limits of the integral because we were integrating over an angle, so we had to figure out from what angle to what angle we were integrating. Um, and then we just do the integral of cosine theta d theta. Now that's something that I've said in the past that you need to know the integrals of x to the n. I haven't said you need to know the integral of, x, of cosine theta d theta, but this is something that you can easily look up um, it's something that you should know at this point if you've done any integrals. The integral of cosine theta d theta is just sine theta. Then we plug in the limits like we've always plugged limits into an integral. And what you end up with is what we have here. So that's just an example of the force of a charge distribution on a test charge. Um, and this is something that we're going to spend a fair amount of time with is different kinds of charge distributions and in particular symmetric charge distributions. But I do want to uh, take this to, to, the, to the one step further of getting back to Newton's shell theorem, which is we can go ahead and we can do the force due to a ring of charge on a test charge little q and see that the net force um, not only points along the axis of the ring of charge, but we can figure out what that is. We've just done that with gravitational masses, so I don't need to redo that for the uh, ring of charge. Um, and then we can add up a bunch of rings that move outwards along the x-axis to make this whole thing a sphere. It doesn't look like a sphere the way I've drawn it, but we can make it a sphere of charge and add up a bunch of rings. And what Newton's shell theorem told us is that the net force due to a the net force due to a shell is the same as if the shell were a point charge, not a point mass, but a point charge at its center. So the electric force between a shell of charge and a point and a point charge Q is kqq over d squared, where d is now the distance between the center of the sphere, the center of the spherical shell, and the point mass, and it's in the radial direction, um, still as shown. And the shell theorem goes on to say that if I'm inside this shell of charge, the net electric force is zero. And if I make this shell a solid sphere, a solid sphere is a bunch of shells. And so if I'm outside a solid sphere of charge, then the solid sphere looks to any point charge outside the solid sphere as if it is a simple point charge with all its charge concentrated at its center and still has the electric force that is the, has the same form as Coulomb's law, kqq over r squared, where r is the distance between their centers. So Newton's shell theorem holds for um, point masses and spherical masses and point charges and spherical charges um, in the exact same way.
So we know that the, the electric force between spheres of charge um, is kqq over r squared given by um, Newton's shell theorem, or you could say given by Coulomb's law because a shell or sphere acts like a point. And Coulomb's law is for two point charges. So in summary, we've seen Coulomb's law for the force between two point charges. I've evaluated, uh, given you the values of the constants. Um, and if you have multiple a collection of charges, you just have to add up the electric force due to each of the charges. Um, and then we, and if it's a continuous distribution, it's going to be an integral. For shells and spheres, we see that integral ends up being that when you're outside the radius of the shell of the sphere, they act like points. And inside a uniform shell of charge, the electric force is zero. That's the shell theorem. Next, we're going to talk about electric fields, because uh, that's a really good concept to talk about electricity. Um, but that's going to be for next time. You'll have to wait. Sorry. Although I gave you a little puzzle earlier, let me give you a joke now uh, to finish up the day. How do you get an elephant into a fridge? Probably heard this one when you were five. Uh, insert, open door, insert elephant, close door. How do you get a giraffe into a fridge? Open door, remove element. Blah, blah, blah. Open door, remove elephant, insert giraffe, close door. <laughs>